12 Abbasid of Kafchet Amud Aleph, possession, an introduction, a Pesicho to Cheskas about Abatim, this amazing peric of Gemara, the third peric of Bava Basra, Cheskas Abatim, we'll use today as an introduction to Cheskat Abatim. The idea of Chazoke, Cheskat Abatim, possession of a, of a house, of a piece of property, this idea of Chazoke, we need to understand the Ritvo, who I think is going to be our Rebbe during this peric at least. Uh, the Ritvo makes very clear that there are two types of Chazaka. When we talk about Chazaka in the terms of property, the, the word has two different meanings altogether and they're not all that connected. The one is a chazoka as a kinyan. There is a way to be koine, a way to acquire properties through chazoka. You do something in the property, you dig in the property, you put a fence around the property. There are things that you can do that are acts of kinyan. They are the transaction that enables the transfer of the property from one owner to another. And here in Cheska Abatim, in this chapter of Talmud, we're learning about chazoka as proof, Cheska's raya it's called, a three-year possession of, of a piece of land, or as we see in the Mishnah, it doesn't have to be three years. What's important is, it, is that it's three seasons of usage. So if it's a, a property, if it's a, a dwelling, a, a house or a, an apartment, then yes, you need three years because the, the, the usage is, con is continuous. But if the usage is seasonal, then you need three seasonals of harvest, for example. Three seasons of harvest would already be a chazoka. If a person held on to a property for three years and it was not his, his rights to the property were not questioned during that period, that's proof. He doesn't then need to carry around title deeds after that. We can assume the, the property is his, and that's the opening mish mishnah of the Perik. The Gemara then says something so strange. Omer Rabbi Yochanan, Shamati Meholchei Usha. I heard from the people who used to walk around Usha, which is a strange phrase altogether. Usha was one of the places where the Sanhedrin was exiled to after Yavne. It went to Usha. It says, Rashi Shigilta Sanhedrin Lusha. Kidamrin and Rosh Hashanah, we learned in Rosh Hashanah that the Sanhedrin was in Usha for a period of time. And I heard from the people around Usha, Shayu Amrim, and we learn later on this is referring to Rabbi Yishmoel. Why call him Holchei Usha, or why the Holchei Usha? It's a strange word, we'll understand it further on. Shayu Amrim, they used to say, Minayn Lechazoki Gimel Shonim. Where do we get this from? That, that there's a three year period to establish clarity of ownership, of, of rights to ownership. Where, do, where does this come from? Why three years? Why not one year? Why not five years? We learn it Mishor Hamuad. We learn it from the case in Boakama of Shor Hamuad. When does a Shor become a Muad? You'll remember if an ox goes another ox, he pays Chatsi Nezik, half the damage. That's if the, the first time that he goes, the second time, the third time, the fourth time he goes already, he pays full damages. Why? Because after three times, he moves from being, the ox moves from being a tam to being a muad. Instead of being an ordinary ox, he becomes a vicious ox. And a vicious ox has a higher amount to, to pay. In the same way as an ox after it has gored three times, removes, is removed from the categorization, from the category of a short tam, of an ordinary ox, and it becomes a short muad, it enters a different category. So here too, after three years, this property changes its category from belonging to the seller to belonging to the buyer. And then the Gemara goes on questioning this, this comparison, but it's like a shocking comparison to open the, the, the Peyrek with. What would the ownership of the field have to do with the, with the ox? There are two things that are, that are really troubling about it. The one is, what, what do we know from the, the Shuramud and the Shuratam? When it does something three times, what it's telling us is, that's its nature. You should now watch out. You should keep this sure. You should watch this ox in a way that you don't watch other oxen. This ox is wild. This ox is vicious. And by now you should know. He's done it three times. So it tells us something about the nature of the ox. But the field doesn't change its nature after three years. What, is it, what does it tell us? And secondly, the, the wording of the Gemara, that after three years, it transfers from the reshut of the seller to the reshut of the buyer, 
What kind of Kenyan is this? This is not a Kenyan. It transferred at the time of Kenyan. We've already learned that a property is acquired with shtar. It can be acquired with chazoka. We, we know how you can acquire a piece of property. Surely the acquisition had already taken place three years ago. It doesn't take place after three years. It's not a suspended acquisition. What does the Gomorrah mean? The wording of the Gomorrah is rather strange. Let's learn the, the, the Ritvo here. The first thing the Ritvo makes the point that we made earlier. Kola chazakot and his karot bekan him chazakasho raaya ve'en zu chazakad kinyan. This is a cheskes raaya. It's a chazaka of proof, not a chazaka of acquisition. But if it's a chazaka of proof, then the wording of the Gemara is difficult. It doesn't say after three years there's proof that it belongs to the owner. It says it actually transfers. Kamle bedushut delokach. You've actually got to do something in the land itself in order to acquire it. But to use the property, to harvest the property, the way owners usually use a, a property, that's what Chazaka is here. And then he goes on to say, one thing is for sure, Havadai, Lord Tesek Adait in Klal, don't think for a moment that this is enough to establish ownership. You can only acquire something from somebody else if they were makne to you. There's got to be a dat makne. They've got to do something. You can't just occupy territory. That's what's going on in the in the KCI in the the Kangaroo Court of Injustice. Can you just can you just uh, occupy territory and then say it's yours? There's got to be a rishus magnet. Somebody has to give it to you. That after three years it becomes in the rishut of the machzik. What changes is who becomes the claimant, who becomes the toveya, who has to bring proof. After you've been there for three years, you are the resident, you're the owner. You are, you are the possessor, and if somebody wants to take it away from you, they have to bring proof. Whereas previously, you would have to establish your ownership by means of deeds of title. You would have to have documents. So for the first three years, you have to carry your documents around. If somebody says, how do you know this is your field? You show them the documents. But after the three years, you don't need these documents. So what is the Ritvo really saying? It starts off by saying, uh, our question, this can't be, this is not the way you acquire a field. Where's the Machna? And then he answers in a way that isn't all that satisfying. Fine, but if we understand chazoke and we understand rishus, there, there are three things we need to understand. The first is chazoke. What does this mean, a chazoke? How does it work? And the second is, I'm going to introduce you, we've actually done it already at the end of Bavim Betsiya, the difference between kinyan and rishut. And this Gemara is talking about rishut. What is chazoke? The idea of chazoka, this idea of when something happens three times, we use it in many different circumstances, but certainly here's one. So we've got one case is with the shor, three times it goes, now it's a muad. Three years of produce, you're using the field for three years, now the field is in, in your rishus. So what is the idea of, of the three? Rebeli Mishkov, Shiva used to explain that, uh, he probably got it from Reb Shimon Shkov, that the idea of three is when something happens three times, you assume that there's a common reason for all three times. If something happens once, it's it's random. If something happens twice, it's a coincidence. If something happens three times, it's neither random nor a coincidence. There is an underlying cause responsible for all three occurrences. That's what chazoke is. So in the case of the shore, it goes once. It doesn't, that doesn't make it a mu'a. It, it, it had a bad night. It woke up on the wrong side that morning. It goes twice. It had an argument with its wife that day. So these things are, are coincidences. Happens three times. There's something with this, this ox. This ox is a muad something. There's a common reason. There's one reason responsible for all three occurrences. In the same case here. What we, what we learn here, as, as Rashi says at the bottom of the Rashi on Sadeh Beit Rashi says, a person doesn't watch somebody consume the produce of his field and keep quiet. He does it once, it could be he doesn't want to have a machloi because he doesn't want to confront the individual. It happens twice, he wasn't that concerned at the time. It happens three times, 
there's a common reason. Why for three times have you not questioned this other person's consumption of your property? It must be because it's not your property. There's a common reason for all three times. So the idea of chazoke is in the behavior of the claimant. It's not the field. It's not about the field, that the field changes its nature, like the ox changes its nature. It's not about changing nature. It's about a common reason for all three occurrences. In the case of the ox, it's because the ox is inherently wild. And in the case of the field, it's not about the field, it's about the claimant. And what it means is that the claimant is inherently not a claimant because it doesn't belong to him. That's why he's never interfered. That's, that's how we understand chazoka. The difference between Kinyan and Rashut, Kinyan is a, an act of acquisition. So it's a transfer of ownership. It's a transaction. That's what Kinyan is. Was mine and I give it to you. From now on, it's yours. Rashut is something else. If you remember at the end of the finale of Bhavamitsiya, we learned with the higher field and the lower field, and we had a, a beautiful toast was read there. The idea of Rashut was to be able to use something without having to ask permission. That's what Rashut is. To be able to use something with nobody questioning you. The, 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 the idea of Rashut, to be able to walk into your own home and it's yours, you don't have to go down to reception and get a key to be able to get into the, into the room. It's your house, you've got the key, you walk in and out of it whenever you want to. That's Rashut. It doesn't mean it's necessarily ownership. You might be a renter, but, but you've got Rashut. Rashut means, and we talked about it, that in Hebrew Rashut means possession, and Rashut also means permission. You ask for Rashut, you ask for permission, and the two words are connected for a reason, and that is that they mean the same. Possession means I don't have to ask permission. That's what, that's what Rashut means. I, if I buy a, a property and I still have to walk around with my documentation to prove that it's mine, I don't have Rashut. I might have ownership, that means. If you question me, I can prove, look at this document, that from January the 1st, 2023, this house was mine, here's the proof. So it's mine, I have ownership, but I don't have Rashut. The fact that you can still question me, the fact that you can still ask me to prove my rights, so that means I don't have possession. I don't have Rashut because I haven't had the the opportunity yet to establish that Rashut. That's what the Ritvo is teaching us. The Rashut says that, what it says here, Elehachi ke'amar, te b'shalosh shanim kimlei b'rashut marzik. V'chi amar shehi shelo, shelekachana, if somebody questions his Rashut, his permission to be there, al ha'orel lahaviraya, now the questioner has to bring the proof. And then again at the end he says, It establishes chazoka. That's what chazoka means. That once three seasons of usage have passed, I've established my rights to possess this without having to ask anybody permission for it. And the ritvo has a different translation for the whole Chei Usha. The Ritvo says, Yesh mefarshin milashon v'ushia yachitu in, in a posuk in Ezra, hayordin liyesoda shel halacha. This is not talking about Usha the place. Says the Ritvo, if you now understand the depth of what we've just established, to understand the difference between Kinyan and Rashut, to understand what Chazoka means, and therefore why you can in fact learn the Chazoka of a field, which is about laws of acquisition of property, from the laws of, of a Muad and a Tam, which is about the behavior of an ox, they seem to be completely disconnected. But if you go deep enough into the underlying meaning of the word Kinyan and the word Chazoka and the word Rashut, then you'll understand why you can learn one from the other. And that's the whole Cheyusha. The, the Posukis, the people in Eretz Yisrael, wrote to the, to the Persian king and said that these Jews have come back and they're building the Beis Amikdash. And we see already that they, this bad city of Yerushalayim, they're completing the walls. And the Asher Yachitu, and that Mitzudah says, the Asher Yachitu means they're connecting the foundations. And that's a beautiful idea, because that says something about the way we learn Torah, not just the way we build Yerushalayim. You connect foundations. When you get to the foundation of an idea, and you find the foundation of the idea of Shor Hamuad, and the foundation of the idea of, of Cheska Sabatim, and you can understand the connection between the two, the pattern, the design of these two foundations, that's how we learn. 
That's the whole cheyush of people who know how to learn, people who can get to the very essence of, of an idea. Interesting, Rashi translates Vushya as walls. He doesn't translate it as foundations. So Rashi doesn't learn the Pesach in Ezra the way the, uh, the Ritvo learns it. The Ritvo learns it the same way as later on the Mitzudah the Tzion teaches it, Inyan Yusod. So this idea of Yusod, so now we understand this whole Gemara much better. They say, Shamati mi Yusho. From those people who get down to the essence of what Chazoka is, this idea of three years, this idea of three times of, of going, making a sure instead of being a tam, making him a muad and responsible for full damages, those who get down to the essence of the foundation of these two principles can connect them. And once you've connected them, you understand the origin of this, of this law of Chazoka. In the case of the Marat Machpela, why, why does it say, Vayakom Sedei Ephron Avraham? The, uh, uh, they, we've got this, this idea of the field, Sdei Ephron, became Avraham's. And that was Rashut, that's not just Kinyan, it's Vayakom Nemiknele. Why is that so? Because that was Le'enei B'nei Chet. That was public. Since it was public, nobody could come and ask anymore. There's no, he has Rashut. What is Rashut is that you have to ask permission. Once he acquired the Marat HaMachpelah in front of the entire community, he doesn't have to ask permission anymore. anymore. The whole community knows uh, that, that this is his. And, and back to the Kangaroo Court of Injustice, the I idea that the Ritvo says, which is a fundamental principle in law, although they, they ignored it, The only right you've got to come and question somebody's use of a property is if you have proof that you it was once yours or it was once your father's. But if nobody's claiming that they were there previously, there's no conversation, there's no case. And this case that was brought before the, the KCI was brought by the General Assembly. The General Assembly has no right to Eretz Israel. Who can claim Eretz Israel? Somebody would have to come and say, they took it from us. Who did we take it from if we took it from anybody? Whose was it before? It, it was the Jordanians, the Jordanians ask, aren't asking for it back. It was the British Mandate, they're not asking for it back. It was the Turks, they're not asking for it back. It was the Mamelukes, it, they're not asking for it back. It was the Roman Empires, they're not asking for it back. Nobody's being Ma'orer. There's some new group of people, Palestinians, who are saying, we want it. There's no Iru, you can't question it. This is something that we have, we've lived in, we have, we have not only Kenyan, we have Rushus, and there's a, nobody has the right to be a Ma'ura to question that, that ability of the Jewish people to live in Israel without having to ask permission from anybody.